What's it like to be both a movie star and an avid fan? My name is Elizabeth Alfano, host of the TV show, web series, and podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party. Actress Ileana Douglas joins me today. From growing up with her grandfather, classic movie great Melvin Douglas, to working along some of the best filmmakers of our time, like Martin Scorsese. Ileana dishes with me about her life in and out and around movies. A bit more about my guest. Ileana has appeared or starred in films such as New York Stories, Cape Fear, To Die For, Goodfellas, Alive, and Ghost World. She has been in TV shows from The Gary Shandling Show to Ugly Betty and many, many more. Want to serve a champion of movies if popcorn and raisinets aren't an option? Ileana is a fellow vegetarian, so I order in crispy Brussels sprouts and crushed avocado and chili bruschetta. Plus, we have spicy Marcona almonds and baby kale and organic grain salad, all from the Cavatina restaurant at Sunset Marquis. And what could go better with this than Kendall Jackson's Grand Reserve Chardonnay? Barrel aged 10 months in 87% French oak, Kendall Jackson's Grand Reserve Chardonnay has notes of lush tropical fruit intertwined with lemon, lime, and floral notes. Elegantly layered, this wine exhibits a rich texture and firm backbone with a hint of vanilla and spice to round out the long finish. So grab your own glass of Kendall Jackson and sit tight. After a quick word about podcasts and a word from Kendall Jackson Winery and a chef's choice, I'll be right back with actress Ileana Douglas. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, The Celebrity Dinner Party, with me, Elizabeth Alfano, on iTunes. Just search for The Celebrity Dinner Party, or if SoundCloud is your thing, you can find me there, too, by searching for The Celebrity Dinner Party. Subscribe, and you'll never have to hunt for engaging interviews again. They'll just land on your computer or your iPhone every time a new podcast comes out. So subscribe now to The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano, because the best conversations really do happen over dinner. Chef's Choice is the brand you can trust for all your sharpening needs. Chef's Choice highly acclaimed knife sharpeners are used by home chefs, professionals, and outdoor enthusiasts around the world. Chef's Choice has a passion to create the very best. Whether you're seeking advanced engineered waffle makers, kettles, food slicers, knife sharpeners, and more, Chef's Choice is the brand you can trust. For more information, visit chefschoice.com or call 800-342-3255. Kendall Jackson is a proud sponsor of The Dinner Party Podcast with Elizabeth Alfano. Kendall Jackson believes it's not what you're drinking to, it's who you're drinking with. Before your next dinner party, visit kj.com to explore Kendall Jackson's diverse collections of high quality California wines. From Vintner's Reserve Chardonnay, America's favorite Chardonnay for more than 24 years, to their newest release of vineyard designate wines. Kendall Jackson's got a wine you'll love. Enjoy Kendall Jackson responsibly. Kendall Jackson Winery, Santa Rosa, California. We are live, Facebook Live. So the last time we did this, I think we may have had a technical glitch, but not today, right, Josh? We are live and it's official. We are live <laughs> right from the Sunset Marquee, like always, Bar 1200. I am dishing today with actress Ileana Douglas. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It was perfect timing as that I <laughs> ate. Not that I haven't been doing this for years and years. Well, that's what we do here. We eat. So you might catch us mid-bite. It could go that way. Just to tell you, in fact, what we're eating. So we've got yeah. some Brussels sprouts and we've got a bruschetta with uh, crushed chilies and avocado. And you and I are splitting a whole grain salad 
Baby delicious. kale salad, and then Marcona almonds, just in case you feel mm -hmm. the need. I know. Everything's delicious. So while we were getting up and ready for Facebook Live, I just learned, speaking of almonds, one of my very favorite things is nuts, and I just mm -hmm. learned that you make your own peanut butter. Yes, I do. I um, love that. You, you have to, the only issue is you have to be brave and get a Cuisinart. It's yes. a little grown up. Yes, and expensive, sort yeah. of. They have, actually, the one I have isn't that expensive. Um, it's, uh, and... And um, I've used it now for a year, so it's working out. It's, a, it's a Hamilton Beach, because I figured... Oh, right, Hamilton Beach. It doesn't work out. I didn't spend that much money on it. But a Hamilton Beach Cuisinart, and it, we have our local Trader Joe's here, so I get the salted peanuts. Oh, yeah. Put them in the Cuisinart, grind them up till they're a paste. I personally add a little bit of peanut oil and a little touch of agave. It just gives, makes it a little smoother. Yes. And um, it's amazing little go-to gift too. People always, oh. if you get the little mini bell, uh, bell jars uh, and just put a little peanut butter, just to bring someone a little apple butter. I love this. Usually what I do, but I'm gonna think about this now. Usually what I do is I make Italian sauce mm -hmm. and I give it to everybody at Christmas. Ah. So I saute all the onions and garlic and yeah. just tomatoes. So I don't put any meat in it because I don't eat meat. Yeah. And I just big fat jars of it and then people can freeze it all year long and yeah. then you always have tomato sauce, homemade tomato sauce. Um, and I love the idea of giving gifts for Christmas. Oh, me too. Me too. But the, the, the peanut, you know, very few people don't like peanut, peanut butter. Peanut butter, right. What's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah there's something, yeah. Something Mine. wrong if you're not liking peanut butter. Although every time I travel outside the U.S., people make fun of peanut butter. It's well, really an American love. It, when I used to visit friends in Italy, though, they would always ask me to bring them peanut oh, really? butter. Oh, <laughs> really? They don't, they don't make it there. Right, right. Closet peanut butter lovers. Yes. Uh, well, so, of course, we're here to... I've got book handy. Uh, speaking of Christmas gifts, I know this, yeah. this probably sounds like a plug, and it's not meant to. I, I was just telling Ileana before we started, I interview a lot of people, of course, on this show, and so I read a lot of books, and I have to tell you that I really, really did love this book. Thank you. And I'm about 80% finished. And what I love about it is it really, so I blame Dennis Hopper, and it mm -hmm. really is keeping me company because it's every chapter is its own story, and it just propels you to want to read the next and the next. And of course, it doesn't hurt that you're uh, talking about some people like Ethan Hawke and James Wood and Robert De Niro and Martin Scorsese. So Marlon Brando. And Marlon Brando. And, yeah. And basically, it's I. I mean, when I set out the premise of writing the book, I said that I wanted people to feel as if they were sitting next to me watching a movie and hearing me tell a great story, either about a movie that I was in or a personal experience that I had. Movies have been so much a part of my life, changed my life, you know, when in doubt, I live my life as if it's a movie, so. It reads kind of like a movie. I do feel like I'm sort of with you all the way through, you know, the ups and downs of what might happen in a movie. That's right, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I, I'm in my, I'm, I don't know if I'm in my middle act now or my third act, I have no idea how it's gonna end, but hopefully it'll end in a, in a happy way. And the, you know, the, my work lately with Turner Classic Movies has brought me again, like face to face with so many incredible actors and actresses and I was telling you before we went on I just got off the the TCM movie cruise hanging out with uh, Kim Novak and Jerry Lewis and so you know there'll be uh, I'm so many people oh my god Leslie Caron each year oh my god Leslie Caron oh my Gigi oh Dick Cavett who was a childhood hero of mine so oh. so many people that I've loved and watched in the movies I've then had personal interaction with them, and that'll be for future books, but that's how these stories are. If you love movies and you love you know, stories about movies that are kind of uplifting, then I think the book will be for you. Also, my begins, the reason it's called I Blame Dennis Hopper is that my parents were so enamored with the movie Easy Rider that uh, my dad ended up uh, leaving his job and starting a commune and emulating Dennis Hopper. So I really had kind of Dennis Hopper uh, as, a, as a father growing up. And then I became an actor and worked with the real life Dennis Hopper and I had my own kind of epiphany. Uh, so that's what, again, the story of the, the book is this idea that, 
you know, sometimes things that happen, you know, sometimes your life has a destiny, and mine was foretold by Dennis Hopper. And so hopefully he'll appre he appreciates that. I think he does. Well, so you're skipping ahead, if I may, to some of the wonderful parts of the book, but I want to go back and sort of begin with the beginning. Sure. So you have this funky, funky growing up experience. So according to your mother, you're poor. Right. Uh, your father was an artist and mm -hmm. then had decided to kind of drop all say off the face of the planet because of Easy Rider. So he starts a commune, uh, lets go of his job, and, and sort of everything is, that's what starts it's about, man. Starts a band. Starts a band, right, in, in your house, right, <laughs> gets, in your garage. It's a lot of goats and chickens and hippies <laughs> and we're suddenly living in, like uh, I call it my easy rider childhood. Yeah, but then at the same time, your grandfather is Melvin Douglas. And right. so you're sort of living this hippie commune life, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're a high upper echelon of New York Hollywood life. Well, that's, that's sort of what I talk about, the juxtaposition, and that my parents, in a sense, were in one movie. They were in their, you know, 1970s counterculture, Easy Rider movie, and then I made the connection that my grandfather was a famous movie star, and once I kind of discovered that, I wanted to be very much in his movie. I wanted to be... <laughs> that movie's better. Yeah, because he <laughs> lived on Riverside Drive, and I had my own room and a television, and there was lots of food. And, and he doted on you. And he doted on me, and uh, but again, I talk about experiences being, you know, learning about movies because of him and that and and that really uh, kind of set me up for wanting to be be in movies myself well and it's this interesting foray so you're with your grandfather and you see that life and also you have the the bug just of acting mm -hmm. and you want to make it in that world but you see yourself and this happens throughout the book you see yourself very much as an outsider so yes. you're telling the story like oh these are celebrities and that's not me. Although we know that that's not true, but okay, we'll, we'll go with it. Fine, Eliana. Uh, so you, you tell it like oh, those are celebrities over there, and yes. I'm watching from, I being Eliana, watching from the outside, looking in. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you traverse, and you go and do movies like Cape Fear and Alive, which is one of my favorite movies, and um, Goodfellas. And so then you sort of are a celebrity, and I'm sure people have stalked you around town at some point. Which isn't the point of being a celebrity. You do it for the work you love, and I'm sure that that's right. But So you go in and out of this life. Yes. Well, I always think of myself as that kind of insider-outsider. You know, when I was a kid, my grandfather took me on the set of being there. It was a life-changing experience. Um, again, this idea that I had posters of Peter Sellers on my wall, and now I'm watching Peter Sellers act in a film with my grandfather. So bizarre. Yeah, it became yeah. like, that became a kind of a temple of art of something that I really aspired to. But I also think that because of the way I grew up and because of the idea that, you know, we didn't really have any money and how would I approach this, that that also made me feel a little bit like, you know, like an outsider. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, my main goal was that I wanted to be in show business in some way, and I wanted to be around movie stars, because mm -hmm. um, I just thought they were the greatest. So I've always tried to maintain acting in the movies, uh, but then also becoming friends with a lot of the people that I admired, and hopefully telling their story accurately in the way that I observed. Well, what's nice about that for us as the reader, and mm -hmm. I think also maybe if, if I can say charming for you as a person, is that because of that inside-outside perspective, you maintain a very, you still get giddy about it. You still oh, are over the moon to talk him. to somebody like Richard Dreyfuss. I, when I, with Dick Cavett, I mean, I, we'll talk about Richard in a minute, but I couldn't wait on the cruise because yeah. I could bring Dick Cavett. He was the first autograph I ever got. Mm. And so I brought his book. Uh, I had a book about the Marx Brothers. I was very much enamored with Groucho Marx. And there was a picture of him and Groucho, and he signed the book. And this was in 1979. Mm. <laughs> he signed the book. So I brought the book for him to re-sign in 2016. Oh, how great. And we had this 
great conversation about that. And he said, I have a feeling we're very much alike. I said, oh yeah, like I'm stalking you. <laughs> he stalked all of his favorite people. But in speaking about somebody like Richard Dreyfus, you know, he's not somebody that we talk about probably in the pantheon of actors. And so I wanted to put him in the pantheon mm -hmm. because in my growing up, he was a part of every, he was, he seemed to be in every movie I would see at the drive-in. And I very much wanted him to be, you know, he was like my imagined friend. And I identified with him and wanted, pretended I was him and it gave me confidence. He had, a, it was the next step after Groucho Marx to go from Groucho Marx to Richard Dreyfus, <laughs> And the movie, The Goodbye Girl in particular, movies like Jaws, you know, I love that. I just identified with that character. And then of course, that's the way, you know, my life took this turn and I ended up working with him and uh, and eventually we became friends. And then wow. I ended up interviewing him a number of times for Turner Classic Movies. And so it's been that thrill that I bring I wrote about him extensively in the book, and that was one of the things he said. I've never had somebody write about me so accurately and not interview me. Oh, wow. I see I, what you mean. It's simply by my impressions of watching his films and talking about what his films meant to me. And that's how all the people are, you know, when I'm writing about De Niro. It's, it's my observations culling some things from journals that I had at the time but my observations of again what what Richard Dreyfus has meant to me to society and to the film world and yeah. it's the same thing with Robert De Niro what that time frame of Goodfellas right. a movie that so much is written about yes but I use the phrase in the book because people would always ask me what's it like you know this very funny what's it like to work with Robert De Niro and this this phrase that you get and I said I'm that's my liftoff point I'm gonna take that phrase and devote an entire chapter to it uh -huh. and as you were saying which was one of my goals when I wrote the book it's not a career book it's a book of stories right. with with a beginning a middle and an end about a specific actor or specific movie star and again, in terms of, you know, what is it like? Because I, I didn't think that it, anyone has ever written specifically, technically, what's it like to work with Robert De Niro? And I'm going to read an excerpt from the book in a little while. Oh, sure. Uh, which is, which talks about just that. But I'll just make one comment before I, we sort of move on to Martin Scorsese. Oh, how fun is that? Uh, that the book has a feeling of fairy dust on it or mm -hmm. stardust because you you do emulate Richard Dreyfuss and then get to work with him. And who thought that you'd meet Dennis Hopper, who your dad had sort of, yeah, you know, organized his life around at some point. Co-opted. Uh, right, co-opted, and then you'd get to work with him. And so there's this sort of serendipity or fate, as you say. And I'll, I'll give the example of with Martin Scorsese. You actually started working with him because of your screams. Go yes. ahead and tell me. Well, it's uh, again a very extended story, um, which was co which is called "Screaming for Marty," and which a we, chapter in your book, a chapter in my book, and we go back to, I believe it's, you know, 1984, 83, something like that. I'm in acting school. I get cast in a play. I have a very tiny part, and the only thing that's memorable in the play is that I get murdered. And uh, there's an extended discussion with me and the director about that. And uh, he tells me that I have a great blood curdling scream and I should put it on my resume. And I do and completely forget about it. And then I'm working for a film publicist named Peggy Siegel. Sure. As I explained, a series of events happen. I get cast in a small part in a Frank Perry movie. I'm in a theater group with people that are uh, working for various directors in that building and um, Martin Scorsese's assistant says hey you know what give me your resume you never know something may come up and a couple weeks later I get this call I'm at my desk working for Peggy and she says I see on your resume it says 
you have a great scream. Is that really true? I go into this long detail, play, get <laughs> murdered, stabbed, great scream, put it on your resume. One thing that leads to another, come down at five o'clock, scream for Marty. I go down five o'clock, scream for Marty, you know, and so his editors, producers, they're all there. I come in, I, I do my scream. They say, that's horrible. How do you do that? I say, I work for a publicist, pretty easy, you get a good laugh. And, you know, bing, bang, bong, I'm like uh, in the movies again. So I, I go to do what is called a loop group, which I don't even know what that is, but I say, sure. And I start doing background voices and, and then eventually do my, my screaming. I dub the screams of another actress in the film. and. One thing leads to another, but as each day that I'm going down, it starts with the screen, but each day that I'm going down, we start talking more and more about movies and it leads to my getting a longer part and it leads to our, you know, becoming friends. And it's all because I, I mean, it's ridiculous. So most of the stories, incidentally, if you, if a publicist made them up, You'd say, you wouldn't believe this. You'd be like, okay, you'd this say is it's a little bluff, come or, yeah. It's a little too meat cute, you know. Do you feel that life is faded and predestined, or I, d I definitely feel, and as I said this in the introduction, I feel very strongly that life is a movie that you can change at any time huh. you want. That you can say, I don't like the way this movie is going and you just back up and change it, you know. Um, some things, I believe in fate to the certain extent that if you believe in something with the childlike belief that I have, you will get everything you wished for. Come on, lucky seven. <laughs> and so in that sense, but I don't feel that it's predestined, I feel mm -hmm. that you have to make, you know, a lot of opportunities for yourself. But I certainly believe that if you're open to possibilities, if you're open to stardust, you will see those things. And I do see patterns in people's lives that aren't even necessarily in show business, mm -hmm. that they get to meet their idols nice. or they, you know, their paths cross in some unique way that opportunities are there and you just have to accept them and they come your your way and it's a little bit of the same question but also the question with a twist you know particularly in your profession but I'll say for you in your life as well mm -hmm. as your profession as a whole how much do you feel of it is luck and how much is work and it's some combination therein probably it's always a combination for instance I mean I write about when I went to work for Peggy Siegel, I was, she didn't even know I was an actress. That's amazing. You know, the only reason I got hired was because I had an incredible knowledge of film history, film personalities. And as I said in the book, you know, knowing who, uh, you know, Betty Comden and Adolph Green were and knowing that Adolph Green was married to Phyllis Newman, but his partner was Betty Comden was an actual skill, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, those are the things that, you know, that you need in publicity and remembering, uh, where do I know him from? Oh, right. he's the director of such and such. Right. And his wife's name is Rosemary. And right. the, the, and it was a skill, who knew? So but, I found my calling. But I think there's a great life lesson to this. And that is, so what seems like random, maybe gossip will say for other people here in publicity is an actual skill. So I would say when you're following your passion, so mm -hmm. you didn't know where movie trivia was gonna take you. No. But therein, by sort of delving deep into what you love, it had this outcome that you maybe couldn't have expected. Well, I knew, you know, well, all my, we, I went to acting school and all of my other friends were, you know, ha had like really struggling with like w doing uh, waiting tables. Sure. And I just thought, how are you going to get in a movie waiting a right. table, you right. know? So I accepted basically an internship for, you know, practically no, no money. Right. But 
I knew enough, you know, but we were working with these really important right. people. And but for me, working at the Brill Building, I had seen so many movies and, you know, the one in particular is it sounds like it's real cornball stuff, but it's called The Best of Everything. It's a it's one of these three career gals, okay. uh, Susie Parker, uh, Diane Baker and Hope Lang, you know, go to the big city and work for a, a publishing house and they're going to, it's sort of pre-Mad Men, right. you okay. know. But I would watch movies like that, you know, three girls in hats that all live together trying to pursue their dreams. And I believe movies like that. So again, I, I you know, I went to the Brill Building every single day, dressed to the nines, knowing that one day I would be discovered or I, so I was ready. So you talk about, it's on the one hand, it's a little bit of luck the day that the director, Frank Perry, just literally looked at me and pointed and said, you're an actress, right? I have a part, you know, yeah. but then he, but then the but second. he burst into the office, yeah. right? He was sort of uh, caught between a rock and a hard place. They had forgotten to cast somebody. They had forgotten to cast a little day player part and he came running in the office and he said, you, you're an actress, right? And I said, yes, Frank, I'm an actress who answers the phones. And then he said, come in my office right now. Can you do a monologue? I may have a part for you. And here's the crazy thing. I had, I this it. is where the part of luck, but I was ready. I had, not only did I have one monologue, I had two monologues, oh thank God, because he asked me, do you have anything else? Because the only monologue, the monologue I had memorized was the bell jar. <laughs> Maybe a little serious. So I kind of pulled together something else, got the part, you know. That's funny because you're a comedic actress. I mean, you do serious as well, but I think of you as sort of a comedic actress. Well, you know, when you're starting out, you're always trying to go, you doing things that are so uh, way over your head, I think, <laughs> in terms of being overtly serious. But uh, it was that combination of... I was prepared every day mm -hmm. for my opportunity. When it comes, you're like, you can't, oh my God, I can't right. believe I've yeah. all this thought yes. that I put into this and it's actually happening. Yeah. So some of it is, you know, it's the combination of just being ready for those opportunities. Uh, and that's the work part, you know. I, I, you know, you, you, it's the combination of luck, but then when, when it's right, you know, then you have, when you have the lucky break, you have to be prepared. You to don't do squander it. Right. What I love about this, and I felt this in many of the chapters, that it's sort of a, and I don't want to over dramatize it, but it's a very life affirming book. Because, Thank you. Well, I, that's how I feel about life and movies. Yes, right. Yes. And that comes through. And, and for that, I'll say it's a, it's a real joy. So some people are getting it on my Christmas list. Uh, oh, but great. before I hand over the book to other people, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you a little bit more about Marty Scorsese. So, sure. you know, you're on a show called The Dinner Party. So at the end of this interview, the very last question, as all my folks know, will be, who would you like to have over to dinner? Mm. And it catches, catches people by surprise, which I'm not sure why, because they're on a show called The Dinner Party. But sometimes people are surprised by this question. So then I always start so they have time to think. And I say, okay, well, somebody I'd like to have over for dinner is Marty Scorsese. I say Marty, it's like I know him. I do not, of course, uh -huh. but I feel like I know him because, because, because I, the very, my very favorite movie ever done on this planet was done by Martin Scorsese. So. And what's that? Kundun. Kundun is your favorite movie? Oh my God, yes. You're the one. I, <laughs> yes, I am. I've watched it enough for the whole world. It is so beautifully shot. Yes. It, well, is, it opens, he has red on his face, the little boo yeah. because that's how he sees the world and the art wow. of, oh my you God. You could probably get a dinner with Marty just telling him that. Oh, I, well, <laughs> <laughs> since you mentioned it, and we don't want to squander when things come together. Yes. So, of course, I would love to interview Martin Scorsese, and I do love that film. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what did you learn from Martin Scorsese? Because you were in a relationship as well as having worked with him. Yes, um, we were friends before we started the relationships, which is always good. I like, you know, being friends with someone. Um, it adds a nice balance to the relationship. Um, but there, of course, so many things I learned, but above all, I would say the, um, confidence he gave me a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of confidence and belief in myself because you know early on he took my ideas and my suggestions quite seriously and 
brought me into the editing room and I was looking at scenes from Goodfellas and watching and learning and I I knew that you know I did not squander that time I mean I really knew that that was a really privileged position to be in so it was like going to film school you know for eight years yes. um, and also just as a director the ability to create a set a very loving set a set where people really felt comfortable to play and those are probably the two you know overriding uh, things that I learned. So I had Alexander Payne on this show, I interviewed mm -hmm. him, and he said when you're a director, you're part best friend and you're part bastard. So, you know, there's, there's this. See, Marty would totally disagree with oh, that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he, you know, and I've talked with actors, I'll be, I'm so curious now to follow up on what Alexander Payne said, because I've never spoken to an actor that is comfortable with a like a bullying director or a director that's trying to manipulate you psychologically you don't you don't need that which and i don't think he meant that at all i don't think he meant that he was more saying you know sometimes it's this is you know it was a very yeah. short interview it was maybe five minutes on a red carpet but so my take on that was sometimes we were talking about how he was getting um paul giamatti to emote in that mm -hmm. one scene that I love so much in Sideways where he doesn't say a word and he's right. drinking that bottle of wine that he's saved forever and he realizes that his ex-wife is married and pregnant yeah. with someone else and there's no point in saving this bottle anymore. So he goes to like the burger and fries place. Right. And in a, but you know what the scene I'm talking yes, about? Yes, of course. And in a brown paper bag. Yeah. And it is gut-wrenching. And so we were talking about the, the qualities of a director that can bring this out. and. Um, he said, well, you know, sometimes you're best friend and sometimes mm. you really have to be dictator, bastard. And I think by that he didn't mean that you have to be mean to people, but right. you, gotta, you got the times and the deadlines and the move it along and the, right. okay, I'm reading into that, the times and the deadlines. But um, I just don't see Alexander Payne as being anything but wonderful. Well, I'm always fascinated, again, you know, by, and I've certainly worked with a number of great directors, um, but I'm just going to say personally that the best ones that I've worked with, you know, Alison Anders, yeah. Marty, Gus Van Zandt. Yes, Gus Van Zandt. Oh um, and even, you know, the movie you mentioned, Alive, and Frank Marshall, you know, you, we, have, we put our directors up on a pedestal, and you want to please them and make them happy. And, you know, and to me, that's always when you get the best performance, when you don't want to let your director down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you care so much about the film and, yeah. the, and the person, and it goes beyond making the movie, you know what I mean? It just becomes, you forget about the movie. Right. You're, you're just in the moment trying to create something that's really impressive, and that goes all the way back I think again to this experience with my grandfather and being placed as a little kid next to Hal Ashby and watching being there. Mm -hmm. And it was as if it foretold for me what my future would be and the respect that I would always have for directors. I mean, one of the toughest things I've ever, I ever have is to disagree in any way with a director because, you know, even if that, even if I disagree with something that they say, I try to always like I'll do it their way, even if I know that sometimes, which is the worst thing, you go, I know their way is going to end up in the movie, as opposed to my way. But it's their movie, and I have that tremendous respect for them. And it's maybe the same with other actors. You speak that way about Robert De Niro working with him. There's mm -hmm. this respect for him globally on set from everyone like the person who does the lights all the and makeup yeah. and you know all the way to Martin himself. Well that's true that that kind of gravitas you really have to earn when a person walks on the set and everything stops you know yes. it's uh, it's pretty impressive but that you know but that's the way I feel about movies and again when I meet some of these great people from cinema I mean I think that Cinema is a great and rare art form, and I wish we appreciated it more in this country, you know, than we did. Uh, you go to other countries, and artists are just Absolutely. treated on a completely different level. I, I think 
one of the reasons is that you know everyone sees themselves in a movie and I guess Definitely. you could say that to some extent for TV but it's different because mm -hmm. it's short form and it's episodic and yeah it's, it's different a movie has that feeling because of again of its length that mm -hmm. it really could be an entire lifetime in mm -hmm. one movie in one sitting right I agree um, I, I want to ask you the same question about Robert De Niro, and then I'll read a little bit from your book. What did you learn from Robert De Niro? Well, I, I spoke about this, and I think that it's very true for people that aren't necessarily in the movie business, is that he was such an icon, such a big personality, that I watched on the set of Goodfellas mm -hmm. that he could actually intimidate people into literally not being able to act because you know he was such a larger than life person and when I found that happening to me on Cape Fear uh, what I did was basically I had to remove him from the equation completely and I think that that's a metaphor of life of sometimes either the person who drives you crazy mm. or the person you want to impress that you somehow have to take them completely out of the equation and concentrate on what you want and your goals. And the minute I did that, uh, the entire scene and the dynamic of the scene changed in that he was working off of me, which like, the conscious me would be like, that's impossible, you know? I was gonna say, just, just that sentence sounds like, what? Yeah, Give and take that's... with Robert De Niro and that your acting might be affecting his acting. What? Yeah. Not to belittle your acting, but... But that's, you know, but in that moment, you, that's, uh, you have to do that because otherwise you're just going to be frozen, you know, waiting and working off of what that person does. And it's, cha it's challenging because you have to be brave. But that's what I write about. You know, if you're going to get into the ring with the world's greatest actor, you can't just, you know. Dodge and duck. Yeah. You got you to you gotta get in there and you got to risk, you know, got to risk, mix it up. So you give me a great segue. This is a little bit long, people, but I want to read this. So it, what has happened on Cape Fear, you go yeah. in there mm -hmm. and you're expecting to do the scene. Right. And you say your lines and Robert De Niro uh, whom I guess people call Bobby or Bob sometimes, mm -hmm. it goes throughout the book, uh, Robert De Niro just says, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, what? Well, we go to, I'll set you up a little bit. We're Please. in Florida. Uh, we're doing, it's like my first day of working in this big movie. I've got cast in this big part. And we're going to be blocking the scene with, for the lights and rehearsing it. And you kind of will get an idea <laughs> Um, as an actor of like, oh, okay, this is good. Maybe I need to work on this. But it's going to give you some level of confidence in a sense, like you're rehearsing yes. the scene yes. <laughs> before we do it. And so I sit into the bar and... And, and, he's, and, and he says, blah, blah. He's not really acting with you and it's confusing for you. Right. Is that fair to say? Yes. And so you feel shaken mm -hmm. and you go back to your trailer. They say, okay, we're going to do this all again in 45 minutes. And you're starting to doubt yourself. Right. And you're thinking, I don't know, maybe I'm going to be like the other people who just feel like I'm not good enough to be with Robert De Niro. I'm not sure. Am I good enough? What am I doing here? How did I get here? I'm not sure. So um, you say that sometimes music can help you get into a role. So Always. I'll pick it up from there. I walked to the set like a fighter going into the ring. I could hear nothing except the Etta James playing in my head. I was confident this time because I had a secret. There was something I knew for certain. Robert De Niro was going to pick me up. He was going to pick me up and take me home and this was going to be the greatest one night stand of my life. That's all I knew. I just had to do whatever it took to make that happen. I sat at the bar and started to fake laugh. Ha 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 ho ho ho. Let me tell you. You start laughing with a hundred people looking at you like you're an idiot and it's a little embarrassing. But I didn't care because I had a secret. It was like the more people were rolling their eyes at me, the funnier I thought I was. And De Niro was looking at me like he wasn't quite sure I was, what I was doing. But he was intrigued. I could tell. A fire was in his eyes and I was pretty sure I was causing it. He started topping me now, coming alive, and the scene started cooking. I knew I wanted to use this 
desperate kind of laughing. I kept on laughing, banging the bar, telling jokes, and somewhere along the way, I was laughing for real. Pretty soon, the whole set was laughing. It was wild. So many folks have asked me if I were really drunk. No, I felt drunk, though. I remember, I remember ordering a sea breeze in the scene because I knew if I said it, the prop guy would make me one. It's something a drunk would do. I got my sea breeze. I think I drank 50 of them. The scene was going so well that Bob conferred with Marty, and they decided that the best way to shoot was with two cameras simultaneously so that we could both stay in it, but also ad lib. We kept the plot points the same, but improvised most of the scene. The cameras kept rolling, and when we got to the end, we just started again. Later, when I watched myself in the rushes with everyone around me laughing, I couldn't remember half of the things I said. My favorite compliment came from Nick Nolte, who said to me, are you sure you've never done drugs? <laughs> Bob and I sat on those bar stools for hours. When it came time for lunch, I didn't eat. I just stayed in my trailer in my drunken Etta James stupor until we were ready to shoot again. I was ready to get back in there, keep punching. I was in the zone. 14, 15 hours later, we are done. All done. One scene. The next day I got to set and I was walking along and now everyone was smiling at me, nodding at me, patting me on the back. Good morning, Ileana. Would you like some coffee, Ileana? Can I get you something, Ileana? That was a great scene yesterday, Ileana. They had a chair for me. It was a director's chair and it had my name on it. I had seen my grandfather's name on the back of a director's chair on the set of being there. Now I was seeing mine, Ileana Douglas. People ask me, when did you know you'd made it? That was the day, the day after the bar scene in Cape Fear, when I felt like I had entered the right to be on a film set, when everyone knew my name. You get into the ring with the greatest fighter of all time, and you hope that you become a fighter too. You can run away, or you can become what you most want to be. That's what it's like to work with Robert De Niro. Oh. Love that chapter. Oh, thank uh, you. And of well course, you, you go on to, to talk about working with Richard Dreyfuss, and we talk a lot about Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro, but um, the cast of Alive, Ethan Hawke, who's yes. just an incredible actor. Mm -hmm. And I love him for his choices that he makes in acting, as well as the acting itself. Yes, which, uh, which again, I saw a uh, full view in, in Alive, you know, who's yeah. very much uh, an independent artist then, and uh, I've always, I admired him on the set and yeah. admired his choices, and I admired his bravery of, you know, the kind of person that he, that he was. Again, he inspired me to have more confidence in being myself. I mean, again, I think that's something that women struggle with is finding um, which me is the right me that will that I will yeah. portray to get them <laughs> because like we I'll play any role you want me to play and the last one you ever think of is your genuine self, self right and eventually when you get hit on the head enough times you, you figure it out that that's probably the best the best one. Uh, you know, I think that's such a great thing that you say. I know that everyone suffers from doubt, men mm -hmm. of course as well, but I do think there's so much societal pressure on women that we're constantly self second guessing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to have that confidence instilled, you know, I always say the best makeup tool is self confidence. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, which I almost think is a discipline, you almost have to train yourself like, right. I don't suck hold on, I'm not that stupid, wait a minute. I, you almost have to remember, like, mm -hmm. no, no, I got this, I got this. And when you have that muscle flexed and you can bring it to your aid, it's right. a wonderful tool. Well, remember, you know, women face years and years of psychological training. You're not pretty enough. Right. You're not thin enough. Um, not being rewarded, not getting paid the same amount of money. What it's, you're doing isn't really that significant. Yeah, I, I, again, facing, you know, sexual harassment. It's just like, it's an ongoing role. And so I think it takes its toll in ways that we don't realize. Exactly right. And it's often subtle. It's mm -hmm. rarely overt, actually. Right. Except in the recent presidential election. But otherwise, it's usually much more subtle so it can just rest and stay with you mm -hmm. and you don't even know it's there that sort of uh, lack of self-confidence well it's funny it's it's a turn of events that maybe you saw coming in your life or maybe you didn't mm -hmm. you've done so much now with Turner classic movies right what and and in that capacity I'll say you're an interviewer mm -hmm. you are not an actress but you are someone who is right. highlighting other actors and actresses oh, I love it 
Yeah, and specifically, you've done a lot of highlighting of women mm -hmm. actors, actresses, directors. Well, I've been very lucky in my career, and again, I devoted chapter to to my work with Allison Anders on the film Grace of My Heart. It was right. a film I had make, got made, got produced. Um, she's a great female director. It was this was a period in the late '90s, you know, mid '90s, late '90s, where. It was very common for women to be directing, and you had all the great, you know, Barbara Streisand or Efron and Penelope Spheris, and then it kind of just fell away. And then now, I think that part of our series, Trailblazing Women, in film is kind of, you know, we're we're really reaping the rewards from a show like like this. But this is um, for those people who haven't seen it it's called trailblazing women in film it's on turner classic movies we just ended our second season where we devoted it to female actresses the first year we directed uh, we had 52 films directed by women just incredible uh going all the way back to the silent era 1896 because again a lot of people don't know that women were directing films i didn't i know it's always pretty incredible women have been completely uh taken out of the history books not mentioned at all and i and last year again we just did a lot of work in educating people and talking uh, to people about the work of uh great female directors like Ida Lupino that you know that were working in the studio system when nobody else was but last year was film directors this year because I felt that actresses have been taken quite a hit is that why not devote time to historical and social contributions of actresses hmm. and again it's outside of the movie realm or exactly oh, okay. a lot of people don't know that you know um, Myrtle Loy spent, you know, more time on the front lines in World War II. Uh, she sold more war bonds than any other uh, actor. Olivia de Havilland had the Olivia de Havilland contract rule, which meant that you can't engage someone for more than seven years. Hattie McDaniel um, took uh, part in an anti-discrimination case. Uh, in, 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 it's on the law books it's called the sugar hill case which ended um uh, a disc discrimination in housing i mean so we again we chose 50 actresses pe women actresses that were on the blacklist okay. shirley temple who was in, you know an ambassador to prague absolutely and right so smart hetty lamar was a scientist hetty lamar was an inventor right. an inventor Thank she you. invented the early technology that became Came the, the basis right. of uh, cell phone technology right. And Myrna Loy was in the, uh, you know, gave up her career to, uh, to work in the Red Cross. Also uh, UNESCO, which was a anti-housing discrimination. So uh, Jane Alexander ran, ran the National Endowment of the Arts. We have activism. I mean, there's not just one or two. How did we go backwards? Because why? it's the, 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 the big why is that why they are not being talked about in the history books. So we have to remind people, you know, again, Jane Alexander ran the National Endowment of the Arts. Somebody like Newt Gingrich was trying very hard to, you know, kill the National Endowment of the Arts. He almost did. And she single-handedly kept it alive. Uh, but the idea that an actress currently could run the National Endowment of the Arts or is taken seriously right. in any way, shape, or form, or could be an ambassador to a country, right. and yet what we try to show, do on the show in an entertaining way, again, is to show the mountain of evidence that women are more than capable. In fact, the greatest ph uh, philanthropists in the entertainment industry have actually been women. Oprah Winfrey, Absolutely Barbara right. Streisand, yes. Elizabeth Taylor, they're the top. They are on the top of the giving lists. So this will be season three on Turner Classic Movies. We just completed our season two uh, and we're going to get ready next year. We're in debates mm -hmm. about who do we focus on. Right. We may focus on women behind the scenes. Uh, somebody like, I've always been fascinated by a woman like Edith Head who ran the costume department at Paramount and yet created the looks for you know Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly and they're they're amazing uh, female choreographers that we never hear about. Right. Um, we don't hear about women 
in general in this no, field. I don't I no. don't know why because they as you say they contribute so much. Oh, they're all there. Right. They're all behind the scenes. It's right. just that we don't hear about them front and center. Well, you, and you can speak to this personally because you have directed mm -hmm. and written and produced as well as you're an actress, but you've done these things that one might say are behind the scenes. They're not. They're the right. quintessential uh, tenets of what makes mm -hmm. a movie, but um, probably most people don't know that you direct. And so how right. was that, directing your own web series, well, producing and writing your own web series, uh, Easy to Assemble? Well, it was, you know, it took a Swedish furniture company, Ikea, <laughs> to, right. to give me, I'd had a couple frustrating forays uh, in doing some television pilots, and they didn't get on the air, and then this was right when web series were beginning and and I got involved with Ikea and they ended up funding uh, my web series for, you know, for I think it was about four, four years, four and a half years. Um, and it was an incredible experience. I learned every aspect of producing. I'd certainly directed a number of short films before that and been Parts At of, Sundance and yes, been to Sundance uh, and thing and produced other projects and have been uh, a producer on some of the films I've been involved in. But this was like hands-on, uh, really doing the whole thing myself, being given you know a big budget um, and being completely left alone to work on the script, cast it. Wonderful. Um, and I it was trial by fire some sometimes in terms of learning, uh, but. Every year we basically made an independent movie. You know, we would make a 90 minute um, film and then cut it into episodes. So it sort of set me up for my future kind of writing, directing career. Oh, that's interesting. So you made it as a film. Right. You didn't make it as an episodic. Yeah, endeavor. we always made it as a film and oh. then broke it up uh, into segments because I don't know. Uh, you know, in, in terms of um, anyone doing a web series these days, what they basically all still do is follow a film format. Nobody makes like a five minute or a mm. 10 minute sequence. Right. They kind of make it as a movie and then you find like a uh -huh. commercial break, kind of right. a natural departation. I mean, if you right. notice on a lot of the Amazon series that you watch, Yes, certainly, but those are long form. When I'm thinking of web series, I think of like five minutes, seven minutes, that right. kind of thing. That seems to almost take the more TV format, right? Well, they, I, I, in my mind, they're still following kind of a traditional mm. filmic natural break, you know, big crescendo right, and yeah. Yeah. credits <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. sad music, you know. So how have you liked directing and, and being Oh, I love the directing. It's a natural progression. So that's my phone. And I don't have it turned off because we're Facebook living. I'm not sure I know how to I'm not the tech person. And Is my it tech crickets? Yes, it's my crickets. It's my cricket. <laughs> and there okay, that that call's been denied. Oh. Uh, thanks, Josh. So you like being behind the camera? Yeah, I love it. Again, I just find it a natural uh, progression from being involved in show business yeah. and loving movies and there's a, you know obviously there's a lot more pressure but I have you know projects that I've written that I feel strongly about and um, part of working on trailblazing women is to also help my own career and sure. you know in in terms of making it easier for women to get um, directing roles yes. I still think it's it's gotten like this much easier yeah but it's still always like a challenge. I think that women have, will basically have to work, um, you know, 10 times as ten hard. 10 times as hard. That ringing is the bar phone. That's the bar phone. And we're not it's allowed not my, to answer not that. Not my phone. I'm so sorry, but That's we're not okay. allowed to answer that one. This is real time, people. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I can see where that would be very rewarding, particularly as we've spoken about how maybe women aren't fully appreciated and so you have to fight extra hard to get your ideas heard and sometimes it's just easier better what you want to do to make it yourself i think that every woman has their own kind of uh technique uh my technique is just to be extremely knowledgeable mm -hmm. um if you're very knowledge knowledgeable about your subject right. i think it gives you confidence right. and so if somebody doesn't think you're gonna be a good director, you know, you have to have that ability to explain your vision by maybe using other films as examples. 
other people that you could see in the film. Sure. But that, you know, you can't just go in it and be like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, yes, that usually doesn't work. It's true. Unless you've got all the money yourself. But if you're trying to get any right. kind of funding, then. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm curious. As you move through the world, mm -hmm. like you say, you have these ideas and these projects. They don't all come through. And you want to be cast in certain roles, and they don't all come through. Mm -hmm. And I always think the role of an artist is the hardest role that there is because security is what so much right. of what people value and so mm -hmm. they'll go to that nine to five job that maybe they don't love but it in the end it is a contiguous thing that they can do and you know you're fired and hired like three times a week as an actor and director and I wonder how do you handle those ups and downs I think that what I've always found is to have other things in your life mm -hmm. you know that balance it out if you love cooking or you know there's so many opportunities now that there wasn't when I was coming up to find communities like-minded communities um, for me it's dance class I love going to dance class and I see you know that's kind of my like pressure cooker to take time off and just really I, lo I love music and I love dance and mm -hmm. taking a dance class with you know with people forget about the the business a little bit mm -hmm. um, you know, because you can't think about business all the time. And I also, you know, I, I watch movies. I watch a lot of movies. Um, for me, that helps. And I don't, you know, know for, we're so lucky in California to have so many great revival houses here to see movies. Mm -hmm. So I have no excuse. If I'm, you know, sad about something, I'm like, oh, like, look who's going to be here. You know, there every night of the week there's a, a great opportunity to go see a book reading go see a film I mean we're, we're very lucky to live in Los Angeles right now which is so funny coming from me and like back in the day when I lived in New York and I never used to like LA and when I would come out here to visit and it would seem like a cultural oasis I really am so thrilled to be living in Los Angeles it's a it's an incredible community the bookstores have been so supportive of my book we've done book readings at Skylight and um, you know uh, Samuel French Larry Edmonds I mean you go in and these people they love books and they're doing great readings and it's been great yeah, I think LA's going through a special time. I feel like there's yeah. sort of a rebirth going on in LA. Uh, it's fun to hear that you actually still go to the movies. So you're not talking about pulling up a movie on the television set at home. Oh, no, no. You go to the theater. Oh, no, I live at, uh, you know, the Lemley Sunset Five. I think it's now called the Sundance. <laughs> But, um, you know, the Vista down in Los Feliz. I love the Vista. I live right next to the Vista. Yeah. I love that theater. I mean, yeah. the, you know, the Egyptian, yeah. the Arrow up in Santa Monica. Yeah. Uh, these are all great. Cine Family, right. uh, you know, Cine the Cine New Family. Beverly. Yeah. Uh, these are some great, great revival houses. And, again, we're lucky to oftentimes have the stars make appearances there because this is where one of the few places left, you know. Right where we can actually see the people um, in person. So you talk about dancing to kind of let go of some steam. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do any cooking? Oh, yes. I would think, because you're Italian background. So yes. let me have it. What are some of your family recipes or your things that you make for yourself or that your mother always made or things you fall back on? <sighs> There's so many. Um, I pride myself on I'm at starting humbly. I'm, I do make a pretty good, perfect egg. Ooh. I do. Uh, All right. Julia Child said that's where everyone has to start. So. I know. So the perfect egg and the perfect omelet. And uh, I do love making things like that, like all the Italian, the frittatas, mm -hmm. tomato sauces, all of those, you know, kind of things. Um, I'm also big. People love my salads. Like, mm. for, that's just been some weird thing that I've fallen into. What do you do with your salads? Well, for instance, like there's a couple go-to secret ingredients i'm always throwing some ginger and stuff oh, a little lime juice and lime things a little sesame mm -hmm. seeds the sesame oil uh -huh. it's always kind of my like little you know sesame trick. oil so rather than an olive oil you'll use a sesame oil as a yeah salad dressing? It, it, i mean it, it, sesame oil with anything that's like a carrot or a cucumber can add i think oh. something 
amazing. Good Just to add like know. a real nutty. Um, okay. You know, I cook polenta a lot. Mm. People don't normally. It's very easy to make polenta with mushrooms. Right. And, you know, is a great. If I'm gonna bring someone a side dish, yeah. that's oftentimes I'll bring that. Um, I like roasting uh, cauliflower quite a bit. Oh, that's another yeah, thing that people, yeah. you know. I, if I'm bringing a side dish, again, I try to bring something that's a little bit more than, you know, chips or, or a salad or <laughs> well, something. Well, uh, so I was telling you before this started, when I'm bringing something to a party, let's say you talk about a side yeah. dish. So when I'm bringing something, I'm going to someone's house. I take my food processor, um, and I chop, or I chop by hand. I've lately, to get out my nerves and anxiety, I do a lot right. of chopping by hand. Right. And it makes me feel really good. Yes. Um, for two reasons. One, I, I like to chop. Yes. And two, also because I did a little stint at Second City in Chicago, which is where I'm from, and they taught us early on that to sort of free your mind, mm -hmm. busy your hands. Right. Fold laundry, which also gets out the kinks, if you will, but n chopping so much better. Hmm. So. Uh, Pretend you're, sh before you do improv, pretend right. you're chopping carrots or you're folding laundry or you're washing the car or something. And that sort of frees up your mind. And so I do find this incredibly relaxing. Right. So I'll chop. I now have my knife sharpener that I can't live without. And yeah, I know. I, I know my chef's choice. I, they're, so they're a sponsor, but it's not just that they're a sponsor. I actually went to them and I was like, okay, I'm using this so much. Why don't yeah. you guys just come on the show? I'm excited. <laughs> I know. I told you. I was like, maybe you can teach, teach me you. to use it, it correctly. It is so easy. You just put the blade through and right, it makes and such it. a difference like three or four times maybe yeah, five right but and then you see because you try to chop a tomato or slice a tomato before and then after you after and you're like oh my god what was i doing before? yes yeah so it's wonderful so you know i chop a lot of vegetables i chop my brussels sprouts and i don't cook them so raw and then i make a really heavy dijon mustard vinaigrette so it's really mm -hmm. heavy on the mustard and then garbanzo beans drained salt pepper and that is a, a big go-to for me yes yeah, simple is always the best simple yeah you're right about the cuisinart that really hell i was in, i it took me a long time to get into the cuisinart but now that i have it i use it quite a bit yes it's a i, I do that a lot also for smoothies yeah. so i'm big into sweet potatoes in my smoothies and uh -huh. so i need like a wow. heavy i know i know i've gone hardcore since i just went vegetarian <laughs> this this uh year so yeah, and I do kick, I, I'm actually, I do eat fish, so I'm a pescatarian. Okay, me too. That's so um, <laughs> I do fish. eat, um, branzini is my favorite. Ooh, that's a good one. That's, that's my a favorite good type one. of fish. Yes, and I think it's not overfished, which is something No, I think it's I... one of the, we actually, again, I'm very lucky, there's a fish market. Right by you? Near us on Fairfax. Oh, that's great. Well, so one more actually, thing about L.A., you see, I know, by the ocean. But I know, because I don't buy... Um, I mean, the hardest thing is to go into a supermarket. I don't want anything that has color in it. Um, I don't want tilapia. Yeah, so, so you know, I try to if you. But if I go to a fish market and they'll they'll fillet and they'll do everything for you. Yeah, and then fish is so easy. Yeah, and obviously so good for you, but yeah. there's not much to it. Lemon. No. You had mentioned lime maybe, and yeah, uh, yeah, really good. I, it, yeah, I use lime in everything. Mm. Ginger works good too. Mm -hmm. I like, like people. Um, lately, I was making like a carrot salad with golden raisins. Oh, so good! And people love that. I but love sweet in my salads. Yeah, yeah, so good. That was a nice one, and put a little, you know, again, a little sesame seeds and a little touch of sesame oil. I'm gonna use sesame oil. That's a good one. That's what I'm taking oh away from this interview. Sesame put it in the oil. <gasps> I, I love se sesame oil. Works for anything. You can put sesame oil in couscous. Which I would. I love to make couscous yeah. and quinoa. The, the oils that people forget about, they're, they're sometimes pricey, like hazelnut oil. Right. You'd be amazed. You could put a touch of hazel, like I make cornbread and I'll put peanut oil in it or mm. hazelnut oil. Hazelnut, all the oils are, are good to work with. They can really add a dynamic little extra ingredient. I've been trying walnut oil and it hasn't done much for me, which is why I'm keen to try, try. hazelnut. Okay. okay. All right, I'll move on. I'll upgrade. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we started talking cooking with peanut butter, making peanut butter, and now we're sort of ending on our sesame seed oil with mm -hmm. salads. But before I let you go in full, yes. I have two questions. So I told you it was coming now. You've yes. had all the interview to prepare. Yes. Who would you like to have to dinner? Um, are, are they living? Living or dead, doesn't matter. Up to you. I, th I think I'd go with Marilyn Monroe and ah. uh, Marlon Brando, who I had dinner with, but I'd love to 
he, I mean, I'm fascinated by Marlon Brando. I think he was, out of all the people I ever met in my life, he was definitely the most uh, charismatic really? and the most interesting. Really? Yeah. yeah. He was, and Marilyn Monroe is just a phenomenon, yeah. and I'd be so curious to see, you know, her legend has, she was one of the women we actually profiled okay. because, and part of the reason we profiled her is that no actor, male or female, has created a mythology right. la like Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she is America. Mm -hmm. She is pop art. Mm -hmm. She's transcended mm -hmm. who she was mm -hmm. as an orphan, an actress. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she's like the Statue of Liberty or yes. something, you yeah. know, and it's a woman. And so, again, we thought it was important to point out that, you know, more so even than somebody like Elvis Presley, I think, there's a mythology around Marilyn Monroe that is uniquely American uniquely 50s, uniquely pop art. Yes. Um, well, and her story so tragic. Yeah. I mean... Self-created. Self-created, came from nothing, not dumb at all. No. So despite what she was playing, obviously it's called acting people. So, you know, she had a lot of ideas on set and, and yeah. particularly some of the smaller movies in the beginning that before she got really famous right that was like bus stop i think of yeah. that movie that's actually one of her that's when she that's a movie she produced right so as that's, well yeah so that was i mean just an interesting personality but so then life be... happened to her like it, it sort of was thrust upon her mm -hmm. to be something more than herself whereas elvis presley i know they both technically yeah. you could say took their own lives marilyn died of an overdose so i guess you could say she took her own life but it sort of seemed like life was just coming at her and whereas right. Elvis Presley in the end did take his own life I get yeah I guess I mean, so yeah. just in terms of you know the life choices that he made but I'm so I'm trying to think if I you know current dinner party that'd be a tough one maybe it would be like Donald Trump and then I'd say here have some of this I know I swear <laughs> there's nothing in it well I always say when this question comes up uh, you know how many people would want to be at that dinner party helping feed him whatever doesn't have anything in it yeah. yes uh, I always say I would like to bring Lady Gaga together with Martin Scorsese so you know Martin would that be a good pair that's always what I want to do interesting it would it would completely depend on whether or not she likes movies Oh, she's got to, don't you think? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, knows, I don't right? know. I yeah, don't know okay. that I've never. Okay, okay you know. fair enough. She's very much a throwback to Mae West. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I like that actually. Uh, so, if she likes movies, she would do okay. Is there anything that Martin Scorsese likes beyond movies? I, I imagine he'd no. be a good, no. I was, I was asking because with dinner party conversation, like what well, else would we talk about? But no, it'd be movies or bust. Yeah, movies yeah. or bust. That's, you gotta, you gotta know the difference between Vista Vision, okay. Panavision, Three Strip Technicolor. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so I will ask Bone you. Bone up on those and you'll do okay. Closing, closing question. So yeah. my all time of all times, and of course there are a gazillion that run a, a good second. So I love um, Charlie Wilson's War, Apollo 13. These are mm. things I could watch 12 times in a uh -huh. row and just be like, oh, it's on, it's on. You know, I yeah. could just do it, you know, contiguously all day. Um, uh, Princess Bride. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. so, there's so many, but my all time of all time is Kundan. What is yours? For me, it's. I just did a Criterion Top Ten because uh, yes, right, of course, fair enough. Hard, there's okay. hardly no number one, but let me. I'll give you a few. Give them to uh, me. All about Eve, The Third Man, Vagabond, uh, Anya Varda, Sunset Boulevard, uh, My Life as a Dog, The Bandwagon, In a Lonely Place, Ride the Pink Horse. I know I'm missing uh, probably a couple other Easy Rider. Sure. Um, oh, and uh, I'm trying to think. And Vertigo. Those and Vertigo. Okay, people. So if a lot of those were on your list and you have not seen, and I'll have to say I'm guilty of that, you yeah. know what you can do for Thanksgiving. Yes. So eat your whatever you eat. If you're vegetarian, it won't be turkey, but maybe <laughs> your mashed potatoes and your stuffing. Eat whatever you're going to eat, and then you have some homework to do. You've got your 10 list of things to watch.
And then get the book too. And you then get read. the book. Yes, absolutely. So go through Thanksgiving, watch all your movies, then get this for Christmas or New Year's gift or Hanukkah or whatever you have. You know, this is a great book for actors too. Oh, I that's would say nice. uh, a lot of actors, you know, if you want to get it, I've heard from other actors, like my agent actually got me your book. Oh, uh, how nice is that? Yeah. What a so sweet, sweet gift. There's a lot of practical advice about acting. Yes, and also the love of it again. That's if anyone true. has ever gotten even mildly jaded, I'm not saying that that happens, mm -hmm. but if it does, this is really a very warm return back to yes. the love of. So I blame Dennis Hopper, and I think we're out of time, people. Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live, and this podcast will be up oh, in a couple of weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining in on The Celebrity Dinner Party with me, Elizabeth Alfano. To stay in the know, follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Dinner Party CHGO and on Facebook at The Dinner Party and at Elizabeth Alfano. To subscribe to this podcast, find The Celebrity Dinner Party on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And if you want to send me an email about today's podcast or anything else, you can find all my information at thedinnerparty.tv. The editor of The Celebrity Dinner Party is Joshua Snyder. The original music is by the Websters and Ship Captain Crew. Thanks for listening today and join me on the next Dinner Party podcast where the best conversations happen over dinner.